You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Brennan Center for Justice President and CEO Michael Waldman discusses his book, The Supermajority, How the Supreme Court Divided America. He examines how the Supreme Court's 2021-22 rulings impact U.S. law and citizens. He's interviewed by political senior legal affairs reporter Josh Gerstein. Michael Waldman, welcome to the program. Uh, your new book, The Supermajority, uh, How the Court Divided America, uh, talks about the current iteration of the Supreme Court and how ideologically polarized it is, uh, the current 6-3 court. Uh, but you also discuss how this is not a totally new phenomenon. Um, we've had other phases where the court was very ideologically polarized and sort of was captured by one, one wing, sometimes angering a large swath of the American public. Um, what are those instances in the past where the court fell under the sway of, of one faction, and, and how did the public react to that? Well, most of the time in the country's history, the Supreme Court sort of hugs the middle. It reflects the consensus uh, of the country, or at least the consensus of the political elite of the country. But there have been a few times where the court has overreached and been met with a pretty fierce backlash when there, it's been um, extreme or ideological or partisan or unduly activist. I mean, I, I count three previous times. The first was in 1857 with the Dred Scott ruling, where the court intervened in the political process to try to, quote, solve the issue of slavery, by which they really meant agitation over slavery. In Dred Scott, they said that Congress could not ban slavery from the territories and that, in fact, black people were so inferior they had no rights as citizens. And reaction to this led to the rise of Abraham Lincoln, his election to president, uh, and uh, ultimately to the Civil War. It happened again in the early 20th century at a time of industrialization um, and great inequality and the first efforts by government to do something about it. Um, in, and this is known to lawyers as the Lochner era. This was a period when the Supreme Court saw itself as very much in the business of stopping government from protecting women, workers, public safety through regulation. Um, and this, too, was a huge, huge public controversy in ways I hadn't realized until researching the book, the, the 1912 presidential election, where Teddy Roosevelt ran against his successor, and it was a race with Woodrow Wilson and also uh, Taft and Eugene V. Debs. Roosevelt's big issue was taking on the Supreme Court and these rulings. Ultimately, down the road, leading to the conflict between Franklin Roosevelt and the Supreme Court and the proposal then to pack the court, to expand the court. Um, and then the third era where the court was really activist and faced a backlash was the Warren Court. Now, I think of that as the court's greatest era. So many of those rulings are extraordinarily important and necessary, like Brown v. Board of Education. But there can be no doubt that we are living in the backlash to this very day. I think today's court, uh, with its rulings, which I think are extreme and very activist and have a huge impact on people, may well provoke a period of response and backlash and political activism similar to those other times. Do you think that the current period we're in is different than those three earlier episodes? In, in what ways is this um, you know, a departure uh, from those earlier eras, or do you just see it as part of that, a continuum of that, uh, of those episodes? Well, it's interesting, actually. The Warren Court, for example, Brown v. Board of Education, was broadly popular in the country. 
And a lot of those Warren Court rulings were popular. There were just so many of them, and they came so fast. And the backlash was to the 1960s and all the social changes as much as anything else. Right now, we're in an unusual situation for a democracy. The country is moving in one direction, pretty inexorably, and the court is veering pretty sharply in another direction. Um, We saw this in the three big rulings in June of last year, in June of 2022, Uh, where decades of social policy got crammed into those three days by this six-vote supermajority of very conservative justices. And these were rulings where the public, measured at least by public opinion and other things, is very much on the other side of the issue from where the court came down. Um, And uh, one of the consequences is we've seen public support for the court and public trust in the court collapse in polls to the lowest level ever recorded. Um, Let's talk about that a little bit. Sometimes people say when we're discussing uh, dictatorships overseas, well, it doesn't matter what public opinion is like in that country because that's a dictatorship and they they don't have to respond to public opinion. And people that study the issue will often tell you, well, that's not true, actually. Even even a pretty severe dictator has to pay attention to what's happening on the street. Um, The Supreme Court isn't a dictatorship, of course, but it's not... um, purely democratic. It's not necessarily supposed to um, represent the whims of the people. Um, How concerned do you think they need to be about the fact that several of their recent rulings seem to be um, angering the public and out of step with public opinion? The Supreme Court, whatever it says, pays attention to public opinion. It has to. Uh, The Supreme Court only has the power that it has because we, the people, give it that power. If you, if you look at the Constitution, the part describing the courts is only one-tenth the length of the part describing Congress and the presidency, the democratically elected and accountable branches. Um, the court has grown to its preeminent role in our system, a- at least in part because the public and the political system trusts it to not just act as a political force, but to uh, be in some ways above politics, to to be a court. And uh, if it is seen as being partisan, as being activist, as just changing its rulings based on who's on the court rather than precedent or doctrine that makes some sense, th- that all undermines people's willingness to go along with, with what they have to say. And increasingly, the court itself and reform of the court and attacks on the court will become a part of American politics. And undoubtedly, that that, um, can't be what they have in mind. They, you know, the the Supreme Court depends on this aura of uh, silence and reverence. Uh, They wear robes. They're not wizards, but they wear the robes and they want to be seen as a court as opposed to just a political body. So they undermine their own effectiveness and whatever it is they're trying to do, if they don't take that seriously. You mentioned that the Constitution doesn't say um, much about what the Supreme Court or the courts in general are supposed to do. Um, In the beginning of the book, you talk about the fact that um, we came very close to the Supreme Court not really playing the role that we um, see it playing today in deciding uh, whether laws are constitutional or not. How close did we come to historically to the Supreme Court really having the kind of minimal role that it does in a lot of other countries? Well, early on, uh, the Supreme Court was very weak. They had a hard time getting a quorum. They had three chief justices in the first decade. One of the justices went to jail, (laughs) uh, to debtor's prison. Um, And as, uh, as, as you know, and People know, including high school students studying for AP history, um, in Marbury versus Madison, one of the early cases, the Supreme Court said that it had the power to decide what was constitutional. But really, for decades after that, it didn't use that power very much. Dred Scott was only the, the next time that a law of Congress was deemed to be unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. It was not a central player um, in the first much of the first century of the country. Um, and then in, in, in the years after that, it was seen as a uh, it was seen as a reactionary force, an obstacle to what the rest of the political system wanted to do, especially in the early 20th century. The Supreme Court really gained its role, gained its esteem in the period when it was defending individual rights and especially 
given the important role it played in civil rights. This was the first time that the court saw its role as being not just to defend property, but to defend human rights. Um, and uh, it, it, that, in the end, as I said, created its own backlash. But it, it, it created also a sense that the Supreme Court was not necessarily one of the co-equal branches of government, but in some ways what the founders were worried about, which was that it would be a super legislature, that it would basically be above the other branches and, and making political decisions. There's no reason to think that's what they wanted back then, although they were aware of uh, scholars debate about how they thought about um, uh, about the ability of courts to s strike down laws about judicial review. But it was something that happened in the states, and it was something certainly they were aware, and a lot of them thought it was the right thing to have. They just didn't put it in the Constitution explicitly. Uh, after the last round of last year's Supreme Court decisions, including the the Dobbs decision um, on abortion, uh, even before that decision, after Politico published the leaked draft of that opinion, we began to see protests at the homes of some conservative Supreme Court justices. I think it's always tempting to think, that, well, this is the first time or the worst time something like this has ever happened. But um, you discuss in the book that uh, during the Warren Court, uh, there were billboards uh, across the South and the West, I think, saying, um, impeach Earl Warren. There was a kind of backlash there that was very um, palpable and and maybe not totally at the fringe of society, even migrated um, into politics to a considerable degree. Yeah. It, one of the lessons of history is that when the court provokes a backlash, it can be pretty intense and pretty widespread and can not only lead to protests um, or billboards or op-eds, but voting. Um, we saw it, like I said, in the 1850s and 1860s with the rise of the Republican Party significantly in response to the Supreme Court. Abraham Lincoln, when he got sworn in uh, in his first inaugural, said, you know, there are some people who believe that the Supreme Court should decide what the Constitution means. We know that's not right. We, we all have to decide that the Supreme Court should limit itself to the facts and the parties and the case in front of it. And then he then he had to get sworn in by Chief Justice Roger Taney, the person who wrote the Dred Scott opinion, um, again, the politics of the early 20th century, much of it was, at least in part, a pushback to the Supreme Court. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, said that they were living in the horse and buggy days. The critics called them nine old men. It was the, it was the stuff of mass debate and mass movements. And the Warren Court era we saw over many years the growth, the rise of conservative activism in the United States on issues like abortion, on issues like guns, all aiming to change what came out of the Supreme Court. Right now, we certainly see signs of a significant political impact and a significant backlash to this court, I would say. Um, you saw it in the midterm election in November of 2022. Now, as you know, uh, the party that controls the White House usually... It doesn't do well, uh, just as one of the laws of political gravity. Um, and in that case, you had kind of 8% inflation. A lot of the fundamentals were not good for the Democrats. But the Democrats had the best midterm performance in decades for a party in control of the White House. So much of that was a response to Dobbs, the Dobbs case, as well as fears for democracy on issues like redistricting. But I, I would even point to something more recent than that as potentially betokening a very significant backlash. In uh, April in Wisconsin, they had a Supreme Court election, and most states elect their Supreme Court justices. Whether that's a good thing or not is a different issue, but they do. Um, and Wisconsin as a state is pretty evenly politically divided, at least among the voters, you know, Democrat and Republican. There's a lot of gerrymandering there, so the legislature tilts more in one direction to the Republicans. But the voters usually are pretty closely divided. And this time it swung to an 11 point victory for the more liberal candidate. And it was a referendum on Dobbs and on the direction of the courts. That's really significant. I mean, political scientists will tell you that just doesn't happen. And if that kind of thing gets replicated elsewhere, that has earthquake level implications. Uh, Michael, you know, there's the there's the history we read about in the history books and there's the history we live. And you and I both sort of uh, grew up to some extent, I think, in the, in the Bill Clinton era. You were chief speechwriter for uh, 
Bill Clinton in the White House. I covered the Clinton White House for a period of years. Um, from sort of that phase of the politics in the, of the 90s um, until really the Dobbs decision, Democrats have been trying to make an issue um, out of the Supreme Court and the threat to uh, reproductive rights, um, the threat to uh, the rights of minorities to vote, and a variety of other issues. Um, and they had not been very successful with it. Um, were you surprised because of that track record of three decades of not having a lot of success on the Democrats' side of the equation in making an issue out of the court with the traction um, that those arguments found, just as you were just mentioning, over the last year, but especially in the months that followed the, uh, the Dobbs decision last June? Well, I think it's noteworthy, uh, and and we even saw an earlier case in September of 2021 where the court basically allowed the state of Texas to ban abortions there, and there was not much of a public response. It turned out that the magic words of saying we are going to overturn Roe v. Wade was what uh, caught people's attention. I, I would probably quarrel a bit or or have a different sense of some of the narrative of the past several decades. For most of that time, the Supreme Court was definitely more of a voting issue, more of a rhetorical issue, more of an organizing issue on the right than among Democrats, than on the, on the left, among liberals. Um, it, you know, Bill Clinton, for example, when he talked about abortion, he talked about wanting it to be safe, legal, and rare, which in a sense was kind of reflecting the Casey ruling that the Supreme Court had just had that uh, upheld Roe v. Wade and, and kind of rein, reaffirmed and reinforced that con- what seemed to be a consensus. There was much less drama about the Supreme Court then. What has started to change, especially in the past 13 years or so, um, is the one place where the court was this activist um, and, and this, I would argue, extreme before this past year was on the law of democracy, which I work on at the Brennan Center for Justice. Uh, Going back to Citizens United in 2010 uh, and Shelby County in 2013, Citizens United basically uh, deregulated campaign finance in the United States, leading to an influx of big money in our system in a way we had not had in a long time. And Shelby County struck down the most effective part of the Voting Rights Act, the great civil rights law passed by Congress. And on those issues of democracy, I think the court's been pretty activist. There was a pretty big response to Citizens United, but you're right that as a general matter, it it didn't rise to the level uh, among liberals, among Democrats that you had among conservatives and Republicans. And uh, I think when it comes to abortion rights, part of it is that people were just Maybe maybe it was hard to believe that they felt this way, but supporters of abortion rights just were surprised that it would actually happen, even though people had been saying it for a long time. Um, it still felt like a shock when the Politico leak was reported by you and your colleagues. Um, it, it still felt startling to a lot of people, even though certainly we, we heard it from Donald Trump and others that this was what was going to happen. Um, you have a Alexis uh, de Tocqueville quote in the book that I thought was uh, pretty striking, um, saying there's almost no political question in the United States that does not resolve itself sooner or later into a judicial question. Um, That got me thinking about the way in which um, conservatives have really embraced uh, the process of of litigation and lawsuits uh, over the past um, couple of decades uh, after going through a period in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s where it was frowned upon. Uh, All sort of litigation was sort of wrapped together, I think, with tort tort litigation, and and to take your matter to court was was frowned upon. Um, Do you think roles have reversed here uh, on the political scene in the last few decades? Uh, Do we now see conservatives trying to wield litigation as a weapon, and, and is that partially a response to their success in getting the, the supermajority on the Supreme Court uh, that you discuss in your book? I think that's a good point. I think there's some truth to that. It used to be that conservatives uh, would attack the courts for being activist. Um, and uh, then over time, there was quite a bit of effort through the courts to enact conservative social policy that they couldn't get through the legislature. 
Um, uh, the Second Amendment case last year is, is an example. Um, the Second Amendment was not found by the Supreme Court to protect an individual right to gun ownership until 2008 for self-protection. Before that, it had always been deemed to talk about the militia, which was the other part of the Second Amendment. So this is really pretty recent. And the way that got changed was a long-term constitutional campaign by the NRA and other gun rights advocates um, to change how the public and then the courts saw the Second Amendment. Um, They started with scholarship. They subsidized scholarship, some of it good, some of it kind of made up. Um, They they won elections. They pushed, and eventually they went to court, Um, and all of which led in this last term to the Bruin case, which was by far the most radical ruling on the Second Amendment in the country's history by the Supreme Court. It's not even close. Uh, The Heller case had said it's an individual right, but you could still have strong gun laws. That was written by Justice Scalia, um, and Scalia was asked, what's the difference between you and Justice Clarence Thomas? And Scalia said, oh, well, I am an originalist, but I am not a nut. Um, and and he, Thomas wrote this opinion, and it basically says that when considering the constitutionality of a gun law in the United States, you cannot take into account public safety. You can only look at what they call history and tradition, by which they mean laws from the founding era. If there was the same law in the founding era, you can analogize it to something now, then it's okay. This is putting at risk dozens or more of existing longstanding gun laws all across the country in ways that we're only now starting to see and that people soon, I think, will see the consequences of. Uh, I think the Dobbs case was, was such a, a big headline moment. It came the day after the Bruin case. Probably not as many people paid attention to the Bruin case. It may be a little more abstract, but the impact is pretty significant. And the day the Bruin case was decided, the day that litigation campaign by gun rights lawyers was successful, public opinion poll showed that only 8% of the public wanted gun laws loosened. It's at a time of a lot of mass shootings. Uh, Some people either wanted them strengthened or as they were. So it was very different from where the public wanted at that moment. Um, But it was what the lawyers on the right succeeded in getting this supermajority of six very conservative justices to do. You also talk in the book uh, about how that case, Bruin, um, illustrates one of the perils of the Supreme Court in, in any era, which is um, these are not legislators. They don't have the same sort of feedback mechanisms that somebody who's elected to Congress or the Senate or to a state legislature even has. Um, and sometimes they can appear to be perhaps more out of touch with uh, reality on the ground than um, people that have to work in day-to-day politics and, and are, are meeting a lot of other people on a regular basis. Um, the thing I have in mind in the book, you talk about uh, Alito's discussing the New York City subway as, you know, a place where uh, pe- all kinds of people are carrying guns uh, all the time. Um, but you mentioned that the statistics don't seem to bear out that the New York City subway is more dangerous than, say, the the, the county that Alito himself uh, lives in or lived in in New Jersey. Yeah, I mean, Alito uh, said exactly right. Everybody on the subway is carrying a gun. Why shouldn't law-abiding citizens to carry gun, and the lawyer for New York State was sort of dumbfounded by this because, in fact, the subways are very safe, even now, uh, certainly from gun violence, and New York City, compared to the rest of the country, is is very safe from gun violence. It was as if Justice Alito was sort of working off of old 1970s movie on a Betamax about, you know, shoot him up in the, in the city streets. Um, now, he, he often kind of... Um, comes at these issues, as I say in the book, sort of like a a Fox News pundit rather than uh, relying on the facts in front of him. But this was a pretty significant moment. And you see this again over and over again where on a lot of things where you have legislators doing things, where the court wades in, it often doesn't really get it right or it's relying on what 
the parties are telling them are the facts, and it turns out that you know one one or another of the parties in a case are you know making their case by shading shading the facts a little bit. What's interesting is that was the first day, and there, the dissent said, well, you know, th- this is hundreds and hundreds of laws passed by state legislatures, by government. They know how to balance this stuff, how to balance gun rights and public safety, which is what we've been doing as a country from the beginning. Um, And a kind of a doctrinaire view was put forward by the court. The next day was Dobbs. And there, the two sides kind of switched arguments. Because there, of course, you had the majority and Justice Alito saying, oh, you know, the wonderful democratic process of the states, they should be the ones to make these decisions. Um, Alito didn't seem all that convinced of that, quite frankly, in the argument, because he clearly is so personally... um, disturbed by abortion rights. But the basic argument is this should go to the states, to the democratic process. One of the challenges there, too, is that uh, it's not as though there's going to be some nice, wide open democratic process in these states. A lot of the states have laws already on the books going back decades or even centuries that were, in effect, defunct, that sprang back into action when they made this ruling. A lot of the states where they have the toughest, the harshest Abortion laws also have the most severe gerrymandering um, or, the, or the most restrictive voting laws. So democracy itself is being challenged in the states, even as we see this very big pushback where ballot initiatives are being won, where elections are being won on these issues. There's an effort to try to restrict the role of democracy uh, in response to that. Uh, a lot of your book is a, a critique of this school of thought that has become more and more popular in judicial circles over the last uh, 30, 40 years called originalism. Um, you know, uh, you mention in it in the book uh, that after that Bruin decision came out on gun control, uh, uh, one of the judges that it fell to to try to interpret this, uh, the phrase you mentioned earlier, the history and tradition, uh, which is can be kind of tricky for judges. Uh, one of the judges said, well, maybe I need to hire a uh, historian to assist me in going through this because we saw in that Bruin case and then in the Dobbs case a pretty robust battle on the court for the interpretation uh, of of history and how to treat uh, the various measures that um, state legislatures and even going back I think to the colonies uh, you know ha- had treated uh, issues like abortion or gun control um, maybe in some cases tracing all the way back to to England. Um, How suited are judges to making those sorts of uh, historical judgments on broad issues like guns and abortion? It's a crazy way to run a railroad, in my view. It it is a relatively new thing. Um, We have heard about originalism, but it really did not become the key dominant way the justices justified their rulings until last year. There are only four really big originalist rulings in the country's history. The first was Dred Scott. Um, it kind of discredited it for a long time for, for sort of all the obvious reasons. Um, then came Heller. Uh, and then last year, the Dobbs and Bruin cases. And what originalism says is that the only legitimate way to interpret the Constitution is what it meant at the time to the people who ratified it. What that means is, uh, in many instances, to the property-owning white men of 1791, say, um, at a time, of course, when women could not vote, uh, at a time when black people were enslaved, and on and on, sometimes to the mid-1800s. Um, and and I think that originalism now being put forward in this way really reveals the problems with it. Um, first of all, the history is messy. The history is jumbled. It's not like you can just go back in a time machine and tap James Madison on the shoulder and say, hey, what should we do now? Um, the founders, for example, disagreed with each other all the time on things. Um, Madison himself, you know, we're, we're familiar with Federalist 10, uh, which was one of the Federalist Papers in which an anonymous op-ed he wrote, that's what they were, said, what we're really worried about are factions. We want to avoid political parties. And you'll certainly hear that cited a lot. Well, within a few years, he'd organized a political party, the one we now call the Democrats. And so Madison started writing anonymous op-eds, also anonymous, saying some people say factions and parties are a bad thing. They don't know anything about history. 
They, we've always had two political parties. I mean, in other words, the idea that history uh, relying on what they thought back then is going to give us a precise answer is is a problem. Uh, another example of that is in the Heller case, Scalia said, oh, bear arms. That must mean carrying arms because the word bear means carry, and therefore it must mean carrying a pistol. Well, uh, some scholars created a database of all the writings from the founding era, and they pushed a button, and the computer said, no, actually, bear arms means serving in the military, like serving in a well-regulated militia. That's what it meant back then. Um, It can be wrong. The history can be wrong. But also, it can be flatly reactionary in its implications. The idea that we today, in 2023, should be governing ourselves by what they thought back in 1791 or earlier is just odd. And it's not how the country has governed itself up until now, a a modern, growing, thriving country. There is no history and tradition of using just history and tradition to make constitutional rulings. It was always considered appropriate for justices to think about the impact of their rulings, to look at the founding, yes, but to also ask what happened after that and what, how have things evolved over time and how has our understanding of equality and freedom and human nature, how has that evolved? It, it's totally the legitimate and appropriate way to make an enduring constitution. This now says, no, the meaning of the constitution as the court ruled is, quote, fixed, and it was fixed in the 1700s. That is uh, uh, massively disruptive if applied to undo laws going back one or two centuries, as these rulings did. Uh, One of the justices of the Supreme Court, uh, who happens to be the only one, is a former colleague of yours in the Clinton White House, Elena Kagan, said a few years ago, we're all originalists now, um, seeming to acknowledge how originalism, uh, which was once a fad, had sort of become the prevailing um, framework for not just uh, conservatives, but even for liberals in the judiciary to um, interpret uh, the Constitution. Um, I saw that there was a panel recently at the American Constitution Society, a a liberal counterpart to the Federalist Society, um, saying we are not all originalists. Do you think, uh, I I take it from the book, that you, you have some quarrel with the notion that we should be using an originalist framework, even though there are liberals who try to advance their agenda now uh, by framing arguments in originalist terms. Yes, I think it's a it's an important moment, an important turning point for liberals. Um, when faced with a court claiming anyway to make decisions this way, and to be clear, I think that these justices are originalist because it's conservative. They're not conservatives because it's what's demanded by originalism. But nevertheless, on guns or on other things, one has little choice but sometimes to make these kinds of arguments. Um, using these historical uh, terms. But more broadly, I think it's been a failure on the part of liberals, and I count myself as one of them, to not take this on, to not take this on directly, and to not have a different, a better way of talking about the Constitution. It was, it was painful at times to watch Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearing. She was so impressive, but she testified Uh, The meaning of the Constitution is fixed, and I will only enforce those unenumerated rights that are, quote, deeply rooted in history and tradition. And the conservative lawmakers were endlessly talking about originalism. Are you an originalist? They they do this with all these nominations and all these confirmation hearings. And the Democrats, in my view, too much of the time say some version of, um, well, tell me about your values, tell me about your family, (laughs) and that kind of thing, and don't engage in in the battle of ideas on this. And I think it's thus been a, something of a one-sided argument. I, I urge senators, I urge President Biden, I urge anybody with a big public megaphone to not be silent about this because I do think that the idea that the country suddenly now has to be governed by, again, the social values of property-owning white men from the late 1700s is frankly radical. And I think that people get why that is not a good idea. Or, uh, uh, you know, when, as, as you perhaps recall, um, when Politico published the Dobbs draft decision, uh, the weekend after Saturday Night Live did a sketch. And one of the things that was so striking to people in that, both in the draft but in the final ruling, was that Alito's opinion cited six times a guy named Matthew Hale, 
who was a British jurist, British is, they weren't Britain yet, an English jurist from the 1500s, I believe, he had sentenced women to death for witchcraft. Um, and he had invented the doctrine of marital rape, which is that a husband could not ever be guilty of raping his wife. And the, the opinion cited Matthew Hale six times. And Saturday Night Live had a, a, a sketch where people were in period costumes saying, we had this nailed back then, you know. And I'm sure most of the audience thought it was just a parody, but it wasn't far from the actual way the opinion was written. Um, just while we're on the subject of Dobbs, um, you also talk a bit in the book about um, one of the most sort of awkward logical parts of the Dobbs decision written by Justice uh, Alito, which is where they disclaim any impact of this theory about history and tradition on issues like gay rights, contraception, even interracial uh, marriage. And they try to assure the public that even though they're striking down Roe versus Wade and the ending the federal constitutional right to abortion after about a half a century, um, that those other rights um, are secure and basically, they say they're secure because we say so. Um, what was your reaction to that? And in particular, what do you make of the fact that uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, who signed on, obviously, because it was a five-vote majority opinion, but then wrote separately suggesting that those various rights um, should be reopened and reexamined, at least to see if they maybe should be based on something else um, other than a right to privacy? Well, give credit in that instance, I guess, to Justice Thomas for being clear and unambiguous about the logical implications of what was in the majority opinion. Um, you described it well. The original Roe versus Wade ruling relied on the right to privacy, um, which was uh, which was a right found to be in the Constitution by the Supreme Court, uh, starting with contraception in a case called Griswold. Um, and and which was the basis of that initial uh, that initial Roe v. Wade ruling in 1973. Over the years, people whatever the original and that got criticized a lot, including by people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who just didn't think the right to privacy was such a strong basis for it. But first of all, it was on the books for half a century. It became part of the fabric of American life. It became dependent upon by w- women for all that time. And also there were later rulings, such as the Casey ruling, that didn't really depend on that right to privacy as much, um, but but on other things as well. Um, so in the Dobbs ruling, they really went after Roe quite a bit, and they went after its um, use of the right to privacy. It, it They said, oh, but don't worry. These other things that are protected as we've interpreted the Constitution, um, the right to use contraception, the right to be in a same-sex relationship, um, the right to uh, same-sex marriage, all these other things, don't worry, they're fine. And it had the tone of nice right to privacy that you've got there, pity if something should happen to it. Because as you say, there was no real big logical distinction made between why why abortion rights really were different than these other things. And of course, Justice Thomas said, no, uh, you you can't make this ruling and not also call into question very much these other rights. He kind of did leave one out, as was noted publicly at the time. Um, the ruling by the Supreme Court called Loving versus Virginia, which said that you have a right to interracial marriage, um, was not on his list. And uh, the, a justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, who, who is himself in a same-sex marriage, said, I see that you had a lot to say about my loving marriage, but nothing about your loving marriage. So uh, uh, using the pun for the name of the case. Um, so, you know, Thomas has been very influential on this court, very influential on the lower courts. He has until now been an outlier. He's been considered by far the most extreme of the justices, but his approach now is dominant and he is pointing the way perhaps for other rulings to come. Do you think those rights uh, are really in jeopardy? I mean, doesn't it seem rather unlikely that a justice um, other than Thomas who voted for that uh, majority opinion in Dobbs would uh, reverse him or herself, say, on the question of of same-sex marriage uh, any time in the foreseeable future, or you really think that could that could transpire um, in, the, in the next five or ten years? I, I think that one of the things about the Obergefell case, which was the case where the court um, recognized the right to same-sex marriage, 
that's significant is that the country ratified it before the court did. At the time uh, of that ruling, uh, uh, support for same-sex marriage was about 60 percent, and now I think it's up to close to 80 percent. I think there's been a very broad, big social change, and that may protect it. I, I certainly would be have been surprised to see that happen, but I've also been surprised by the growing intensity, quite frankly, of attacks on LGBTQ people uh, in, in, as a political matter in in recent months and in the past few years in a way we have not seen in a long time. It's very disturbing, and you know it's kind of hard to know where it all goes. I mean, there certainly are some people, some senators who say, well, now you've got to address same-sex marriage. I think that if the public yells loud enough, the court won't do it. I think that there is always a back and forth between the court and the public. This court is very proud of not listening to the public. They think that worrying about that would be crass and political, as they've described it. Um, uh, but w one has to assume that the louder they say that, the more nervous maybe they are. Uh, you currently run something called the Brennan Center uh, up in New York uh, at New York University uh, that's very active in voting rights litigation and privacy and a number of other um, areas. I think you would describe, you do describe yourself in the book as a liberal or a progressive. Uh, yet when you're talking about that Warren Court era, which is sort of the high water mark for uh, progressive thought and action on the Supreme Court and perhaps more broadly in the, in the federal courts. Um, you say that the Warren Court got swept up in the ex excesses of the era. Um, I'm a little bit surprised to see somebody who considers himself a liberal um, say that. Well, what prompts you to say that the, the Warren Court went too far in some areas? Well, I think some of the ways it acted, not, not so much the outcomes... Um, uh, but, you know, the, the Griswold case is, is, is criticized, for example. I think that's where I was talking about that, that it relied on penumbras and emanations uh, and things of that nature. I think a lot of the rulings from the Warren Court were absolutely essential, especially where the democratic system was broken or entrenched or where, for example, white supremacy had locked itself into power in the South, and it, it, as, as was the case in, uh, in the segregation cases. Um, another case that I thought they were absolutely right in doing was the one-person, one-vote cases, which, which uh, decreed equal legislative representation at a time of massive malapportionment and gerrymandering. I think the issue with, the, with those courts is that over time, and even after Warren left the court in the, in the Burger Court era, there was so much change coming out of the court at such a rapid pace uh, that you started to see a backlash that might not have been there otherwise. Um, I talk in the, case, in the court, uh, in the book, for example, about a, a ruling where the Supreme Court put a hold on the death penalty. The use of the death penalty had been declining. Um, very dramatically in the United States. Then the Supreme Court got involved. Then the uh, then the opponents said, aha, unelected judges are doing this. And quickly states all over the country passed new death penalty laws. So I'm not passing judgments on the outcome of the Warren Court because, of course, I like so many of those. But I think that the reaction over time uh, was, was pretty strong. And the other thing to remember I think the Warren Court era had a kind of bedazzling impact on decades of liberal thought afterwards. That was a half a century ago or more. Um, and until quite recently, despite Citizens United, despite Shelby County, despite all the other conservative rulings by this court, support in the polls for the Supreme Court among Democrats was far stronger than support among Republicans until I think about two years ago. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but some of that is just a generational um, a generational glow, I would guess. Uh, I want to discuss a couple areas of what you think would be a good response to um, the uh, what you describe as an ideological capture of the Supreme Court by one particular uh, faction. L let's talk for a moment about the Supreme Court itself. You were on uh, President Biden's commission uh, on potential Supreme Court. Uh, reforms. Uh, w what do you think is appropriate uh, or would be a good idea? And what do you think um, would not be a good idea in terms of trying to address this through reform to the court itself? So I, I think you're right that one 
area where there is ample room for action is reform of the Supreme Court itself. And again, this has been the kind of thing people have talked about in earlier eras as well. For example, I think that no person is so wise that they should be the judge in their own case. So the Supreme Court should have a binding ethics code just the same as all other courts do. Uh, and and uh, uh, the reasons are f- sort of fairly obvious. We see them most recently in the controversies over the subsidizing of Clarence Thomas's lifestyle by a conservative billionaire uh, donor. Uh, but there are many others as well. Uh, it, it's a basic thing to have a binding code of ethics. I think Congress could enact it, but the court could too, and I hope it does. I also think, and this is something we discussed at length in the uh, Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court, I think there ought to be term limits for justices, an 18-year term, maybe coupled with regular appointments so that each president gets to make a nomination every two years. Um, That's premised on the idea that no person should have that much power for too long. And uh, it, it, it reflects in some ways, the wisdom that George Washington had when he limited himself to two terms. Interestingly, um, every Supreme Court of the states, but one, has a term limit or or an age, uh, retirement age, as do the constitutional courts of other countries. And it's interesting, there's actually a very wide support for this across the political spectrum. You mentioned this commission. Um, You know, these government commissions are sort of notorious for for being a substitute for action. Um, And and in this case, we were actually instructed publicly not to reach conclusions before we started our work. So, you know, and we didn't. (laughs) This was a government commission that worked as intended, uh, finally. Um, But something really interesting happened. We heard from dozens of public witnesses from left and right. And they had all different opinions on all different kinds of things. Some said, I'm for court expansion. Others said, I'm against it. Some said, I'm for an ethics code. Others said, I'm against it. One after another, the witnesses said, oh, but I'm for term limits, of course. There is a national consensus on this. Now, um, I have no illusions that if things started actually moving, you know, it would get more polarized. How could it happen? It was, certainly it could be done by a constitutional amendment. I think it could be done as well by a statute. Um, uh, But one way or the other, I I think there's a strong chance something like this will happen. I think it seems like common sense to a lot of people. In the book, uh, I put out some pretty strong cautions, at the very least, uh, to those who just want to expand the court, Um, you know, who see, for example, Merrick Garland's seat as having been stolen, which I kind of agree with, um, when Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in the Senate would not consider any nomination by President Obama, um, or with Amy Coney Barrett being rushed through as it was just days before the election when early voting had already started. Um, A a lot of liberals, as you know, Democrats say we want uh, to expand the court. It's certainly constitutional to do it, certainly legal to do it. The Supreme Court has been uh, Congress has expanded or contracted the size of the Supreme Court before. Um, I do caution that, first of all, you could very quickly get a retaliatory spiral where Democrats add five, then the Republicans add five, and pretty soon you wouldn't be able to fit the justices in the courtroom. But, but even more than that, I think there's a kind of a, a hidden um, potential backlash to that idea. We see it almost on the streets of Tel Aviv in the response to the judicial moves there. FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, when the Supreme Court had struck down so many of the New Deal agencies at a time when the country was in a crisis and when a third of the country was unemployed, uh, they struck down so much of the first New Deal and they were getting ready to go after the second New Deal. They were getting ready to rule on social security and the labor laws. Roosevelt had just won the biggest electoral victory in the country's history up until that point, and he had 70% of the Senate was in his party, and he found unexpected, hidden, but very passionate opposition. So I I think that term limits is what I'm focused on. I think that there is a way to make the court uh, better aligned with the country without undermining or being seen to undermine, at least, uh, without being seen to undermine its independence, um, and that's what we're focused on. That Supreme Court commission, just briefly, um, Michael, just before it produced its final 
report, which, as you mentioned, didn't take firm positions one way or the other. Uh, two of the conservatives on the panel resigned. Do you know why they they quit? They quit or much earlier than the than that. Uh, I don't know why. I don't think it was. I, I may be wrong, but I wasn't under the impression it was some big ideological protest. There were plenty of conservatives on the commission. Um, I've got a Bill Clinton history question for you. You talk a bit in the book about Bill Clinton's efforts to uh, put a political figure onto the Supreme Court. Um, it wasn't just sort of a flight of fancy. He really seriously tried to get uh, Governor Mario Cuomo of New York uh, to take the job. He tried to get Senator George Mitchell of Maine um, and uh, Bruce Babbitt um, to also get on the court. wasn't successful in really persuading any of them. And then we had the nominations of um, uh, of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and Stephen Breyer. Um, why did Clinton want to have a politician on the court? It's a really interesting point that I think a lot of folks don't know about the evolution of the court to its current point. For most of the country's history, the people who sat on the U.S. Supreme Court were eminent public figures, former governors, former senators, former attorney generals, a former president of the United States. Now, all but one of them is a former Court of Appeals judge. Um, It is uh, a much more technical, much more narrow, much more legal uh, set of life experiences, yet they have so much power over all of our lives. Um, Bill Clinton, who, you know, as you know, was a gregarious, schmoozing politician, but also had gone to a top, top law school. Uh, he thought he thought there was a problem with that. He thought it was important to have people with life experience uh, uh, dealing with real leadership or real problems um, uh, of that nature on the court. And uh, you're right. He tried hard to appoint First Mario Cuomo, who froze with indecision. They called him Hamlet on the Hudson, and this was a good example of it, where Clinton really tried to get him to go on the court, and finally he said no. Bruce Babbitt, who had been the governor of Arizona, widely respected, but uh, that idea got dropped because of uh, fighting between environmentalists and Western senators over who would replace Babbitt as interior secretary, which is kind of an amazing thing when you think of the impact of a long-term seat on the court. Um, And George Mitchell, who was so widely esteemed and had been a federal judge before he was a senator and then was the Democratic leader, Clinton tried and gave up and appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer and, you know, was, was, uh, I think, proud of his appointments, but they also came out of not elected politics, not, neither had ever run a government agency or anything like that. Um, and I think that that is the situation we're in right now, where there's very few people on the court who have much significant political experience at all. Um, I'm wondering if you think that us having a supermajority on the court automatically means uh, polarization. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular about uh, some of the anguished comments that Uh, Justice Kagan made publicly last summer following the Dobbs decision, but obviously these other decisions, um, in which she almost ridiculed other public statements by the justices where they talk about their rituals, uh, you know, uh, that tend to, are supposed to encourage discussion and frankness, like that they have lunch, they don't talk about the cases, and they make small talk about their families and sports and so forth. And she said that it was great that The justices could do that. But if they're not, I'm paraphrasing here, if they're not actually uh, listening to what each other is saying about the the work that they're supposed to do, she didn't find the fact that they discussed their grandchildren to be a particular moment to the public. Um, Have there been times when the court was polarized, but um, there was still frank discussion back and forth? Is there something about the supermajority that tends to shut down debate and dialogue on the court and and lead to uh, strident decisions? Look, what we know, especially from history, is that there have been other times where there's been tremendous division on the court. Um, Once uh, the court was likened to nine scorpions in a bottle, um, now the scorpions are kind of crawling all over the table because they're airing so many of their disagreements in public. Um, There were many times in the past where there was intense debate and disagreement internally, where one justice was so 
pounded on by another during, not literally, but verbally, <laughs> during the debates over the um, one person, one vote case that the justice suffered a nervous breakdown and had to resign. Um, so it's not as though it's all been um, incense and silence, but uh, it really makes a difference when there are six votes, and especially when there are six votes out of nine with this very, very intensely lockstep political view on most things. Um, uh, you, you know, you don't have justices anymore, as you did in the past, who surprise us with evolutions in their views. Everybody is vetted well in advance, in, in the case of the six, by the Federalist Society and the conservative political legal machine. And uh, you can even see the difference in the arguments in front of the court. When Sandra Day O'Connor was the swing vote, or even when Justice Kennedy was the swing vote, uh, lawyers would come in and they would often make their arguments to that swing vote um, because you didn't know for sure where in a five to four court where those justices were going to come down. With six votes, um, the conservative lawyers who come in are kind of triumphalist. They're not, uh, they're not making much of an effort. Even if John Roberts, uh, say, as he did on the Dobbs case, tries to cut a middle path, the, the lawyers in that case didn't really care. They had the votes. There's an interesting moment where um, Abe Fortas, who was a Supreme Court justice and was also a very close confidant of Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, even when Fortas was on the court, the, the, one of the tapes of Johnson's phone calls, Fortas and Johnson are discussing what it means to have a supermajority, to have six votes, and that basically the numbers really matter. And of course, LBJ was the great vote counter. He understood that. It makes a big difference. Um, and, you know, the court, is, the court has been a conservative institution over time. This is something that I didn't really think that much about until writing this book. Control of the White House has been split you know, roughly evenly for the past half century. But Republican presidents have appointed the majority of the Supreme Court since 1970. That was the last time a Democratic president appointed the majority of the Supreme Court. That all predated Mitch McConnell. Some of that was luck. Some of it was politics. But that's just the fact. The last time a Democratic president appointed a chief justice of the United States was 1946. It was a long time ago. So it's always been a conservative institution, but it has never been as ideological as it is now in this era. It has been captured, I would say, by a faction of a faction and is implementing pretty, pretty extreme political decisions uh, that that movement has wanted. And when you look at the, um, when you look at the rulings in that first year, full year of the supermajority, those last three major rulings of the term, it was the Bruin case, the Dobbs case, and one we haven't discussed, West Virginia versus EPA, which was dealt with climate change and really began to curb the power of regulatory agencies in the federal government. That's abortion and guns in the interest of the fossil fuel industry. That, 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 that is sort of an RNC caucus. Um, and, and, and it's a very political agenda being implemented by this very political court. Michael Waldman, the book is Super, The Supermajority, How the Supreme Court Divided America. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 